And this was a, a scene in Fukushima not long after the um, tsunami and and the nuclear um, disaster that occurred. And these are actually two monks who were on the beach in Fukushima doing a blessing service for those who were who were lost. In the United States is still in the process of an extraordinary history making political, governmental and social turmoil. And I contemplated devoting the evening to an additional evening of Sangha discussion only. However, the topic already designated this evening bears directly upon how we as Buddhists should respond during this period of time. This will be made much clearer through the presentations. So the presentation this evening will not be long, so we have a longer period of discussion. And the presentation this evening is on engaged Buddhism. And as it turns out, we're going to begin in the middle. The term engaged Buddhism is attributed to Thich Nhat Hanh in 1963 in a book, Vietnam, Lotus in a Sea of Fire, at a time when his country was in a civil war. Often overlooked is that the book was co-authored with Trappist Catholic monk, Thomas Merton. This was an important facet of both the book and the movement, because we think of Thich Nhat Hanh coining the phrase engaged Buddhism, when in fact it may well have been Thomas Merton who came up with, the actual, with that actual uh, name. And Tick founded the Order of Inner Being, a 14 precept order to promote social causes. And the four precepts are a combination of the Eightfold Noble Path, the Six Perfections. However, there are many other engaged Buddhist groups. And you can see on here two, two other prime uh, persons in this. And that one, the first one you can see there is Sulak Sivaraska, who's known in the West as one of the fathers of the International Network of Engaged Buddhists which was established in 1989 with leading Buddhists, including the 14th Dalai Lama and the Theravada Bhikshu Maha Gosananda as its patrons. Thich was not really the first Buddhist leader to employ what is now called engaged Buddhism, though he did coin the phrase engaged Buddhism. The origins start with Anagara, Anagarika Dhammapala. Born to a devout Buddhist family, he became a Theravada bhikshu and the founder of the Buddhist Renaissance movement in Sri Lanka. And this was in the late 19th century. He was also a pioneer in the revival of Buddhism in India after it had virtually been extinct there for several centuries, along with Henry Steele Olcott and Helena Blavatsky the creators of the Theosophical Society. He was a major reform and revivalist of Sinhala Buddhism and an important figure in its Western transmission. He also inspired a mass movement of South Indian Dalits, including Tamils, to embrace Buddhism half a century before B.R. Amdekar. Historian, historian Stephen Prothero and others have suggested that while Dhammapada was influenced by Western culture, he was protesting against the dominance of Western culture over his own by colonialism. That was when, during that period of time, was when Sri Lanka was still under British uh, rule. And the suffering it caused the Sinhalese people. Thus the impetus for the rise of this and most other engaged Buddhist movements, especially in Asia, is thus not merely the intermingling of Asia and Western religions and social forms, but the imposed dominance of one over the other and the continued influence of modernity throughout the world. And as an overview, the socially engaged Buddhist movement is exactly that, a reformist movement that is manifested in a particular shape of its creative interpretations, which typically, typically center on the pairing of inner peace and world peace. Keep those two, two phrases in mind, inner peace and world peace. And it is fundamental to the notion that all phenomena are interrelated and interdependent. There are many different types of engaged Buddhist movements. 
most concentrate on a particular form of engagement, such as peace, an example being the Buddhist Peace Fellowship in Oakland, California, ecology, such as David Loy's Rocky Mountain Echo Dharma Retreat Center, economics, social equality, criminal justice systems, systemic racism. Lama Rod Owen's teachings on love, rage, and liberations are an example of the latter. There are many examples we could use, such as the late Bernie Glassman, who died in 2018, was an American Zen Buddhist Roshi and founder of the Zen Peacekeepers, an organization established in 1996. He co-founded the Zen Peacemaker Order with his late wife, Sandra Jishu Holmes. But as I said, these are for the most part movements, not schools of Buddhism or particular forms. The overarching field of practice are what we see here, caring for the earth, political action, usually of a specific form that was just mentioned, embracing family and working with others with a core that we can usually identify as cultivating awareness in daily life. The first issue, a question that persists among engaged Buddhist practitioners and scholars alike that deserves attention is, how new and in what sense and to what degree is engaged Buddhism? I made the distinction between the pairings of inner peace and world peace because there are some Buddhist schools and some people may remember uh, Aiken Roshi at the Rochester Zen School uh, and later in Hawaii, which avoid socially engaged, engaged Buddhism altogether. To what degree has Buddhism been traditionally silent on and disengaged from worldly social concerns, inherently lacking a social ethics and leading its followers to escape the world, certainly not to transform it. On the other hand, there are those who say all Buddhism is socially engaged. The contemporary engaged Buddhist groups are new only in the sense that they express in contemporary forms an ongoing tradition of Buddhist social engagement, a tradition moreover that has generally been ignored by scholars and recent Buddhist practitioners succumbing in both cases to the pressures and interests of colonial rule. In this case, engaged Buddhism is thus a revival of an original Buddhism lost under centuries of misguided interpretations. I should say mis yeah, misguided misinterpretations. And here we see a group of Thai monks ordaining a tree in Thailand, obviously. And they haven't been doing that just recently. That goes back, it's a long tradition to preserve the forests. Thomas Yarnell further argues that portraying the movement as new in the first unprecedented sense, as is commonly done, especially among Westerners, continues the legacy of colonialism by presuming to appropriate own and reinvent Buddhism from the ground up. The second issue. What's Buddhist about socially engaged Buddhism? And this is taken from David Loy. What makes socially engaged Buddhism Buddhist? Is it enough to say Buddhism emphasizes compassion, so I try to live compassionately? Compassion is essential to Buddhism, but that sentiment does not by itself distinguish socially engaged Buddhism from socially engaged Christianity or any other socially engaged form of religion. If every major religion emphasizes compassion, at least in principle, we want to know, is there anything more specific to say about the type of social engagement that Buddhism encourages? And Loy would say, the answer, and the most important answer, is no. When we respond to social problems, there is no need to think that we are involved in such activities because we are Buddhist. We do them because we are responding compassionately to the situation, as should anyone, Buddhist or not, who is sensitive to what the situation calls for. Although these Buddhist principles encourage what Stephen Batchelor has called a culture of awakening, they do not amount to a distinct social program. Together, however, they add to more spiritual dimension 
to the global peace and justice movement that has sprung up in recent years. And one of the things that I, that I point out to people when they say, well, I'm really most interested in, in engaged Buddhism. And one of the tests, is it really engaged Buddhism or are they using Buddhism to pursue their interest as opposed to developing a practice and using Buddhism to inform the way they pursue that interest. In conclusion, you are part of the engaged Buddhist movement. We do it together as a Sangha with interreligious contexts. And the reason that I make that distinction is as David Loy argued earlier, there is engaged Christianity, engaged Judaism, engaged Islam, et cetera. And there's nothing that sets Buddhism apart from other religions in engagement. How they pursue it may be slightly different, but overall we're best when Jews and Buddhists and Christians and Hindus and Muslims get together to pursue these, these programs because the programs are stronger because they incorporate everyone. So we do it together as a Sangha with an interreligious context. And some people here may recall when we invited the Rohingya to a picnic, the Rohingya being peoples who are um, from Burma and have come under the harsh government, a uh, Buddhist-led government uh, in Burma. And Tendai Buddhist Institute is an engaged Buddhist Sangha. The ongoing struggle in the US and around the world for democracy, social justice, human rights, and civil rights is not abstract. And I would argue that is a component of the Bodhisattva path. And these are some of the sources for this evening. Now I think of these, the one that I find um, most interesting on a, on a larger context, <clears throat> excuse me, is the one on um, engaged Buddhism by Kuhn and Prebish. Um, that was found in uh, an article uh, that was found in the Encyclopedia of Buddhism. I, I should say by uh, Dietrich, edited by Kuhn and Prebish in the Encyclopedia of Buddhism. There's a really wonderful uh, entry on this subject in there. And so we have an opportunity for comments, questions, and thoughts, and I will unmute everyone so that you can come in. Okay, and hold on while I enlarge the screen. And who has some questions, some comments, or some thoughts to begin? Munshin, I have a question about uh, one of the slides mentioned that, uh, if I read correctly, engaged Buddhism, at least the one argument, is a perpetuation of colonialism. Did I read that correctly? Yes. Uh, can you explain that more? Well, it's and actually there's 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 a uh, increasingly large literature about that. Insofar as it's that often engaged Buddhism says, "Oh, this is a Western notion." Well, in fact, the engaged Buddhism started in South Asia as a reaction to primarily Christian missionaries who were. Uh, involved in telling those poor heathens in Burma and Sri Lanka, et, et cetera, that they were heathens and barbarians. And they then, so the people there used Buddhism as a religion to respond to that form of colonialism. That then was appropriated, that notion of, of standing up to authorities 
was appropriated by Westerners. And they said, oh, that's ours. When in fact, it had been going on all along. As I pointed out, uh, Dhammapada was, was, uh, Dhammapala was one of the people who has been identified, but there are many, there are many others who were part of that movement. And we tend to treat engaged Buddhism, we tend to try to own it in a way that, and I've seen writings about this, that marginalize the Asians and saying, no, this is real Buddhism. What they were doing wasn't really socially concerned. I've, I've, I've seen those, those things in print and articles and that sort of thing. And so that's a, that's a colonialist attitude. Instead of looking at it as a sharing, we try to appropriate it and make it our own. Ah, I see. I you, you see the distinction? Yes, right. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Are there any other questions or comments or thoughts? Yeah. Um, <clears throat> my, my only thought is that, that in a way you could say that it's, socially concerned Buddhism or engaged Buddhism started very early when the Buddha eliminated the concept of caste. Because the minute you eliminate the concept of caste, you can take people who have been oppressed and move them into a situation of equality, at least within the small society of the Sangha. Right. And, and there's no doubt that that was the case. But when we say socially engaged Buddhism, he wasn't engaging the rest of Indian society. He was restricting it to the Sangha. He was restricting it to the Sangha, but he was trying to establish a new way of living and a new way of thought. Yes, yes. Which yeah. could apply to as much as the society is willing to buy into it. Right, yeah. Just a point. Yeah. Okay. I mean, there are, there are other aspects of Buddhism. Um, I mean, we could go back to, to China and talk about the Buddhist groups at that time who were involved in what we now think of as socially engaged Buddhism. Remember, it was Buddhist monasteries that established the first hospitals, that established the first or orphanages, be even before they were established in, in Europe. They were established by Buddhists in Asia. And that would be considered also a, a socially engaged Buddhism. Yeah. Any other comments or thoughts? Well, sure. Yes. Uh, I have kind of a side question. On the first image we saw, was mm -hmm. the third figure on the beach of Fukushima with the two monks, was the mm -hmm. third figure a real uh, a human or was that a digital interpolation? No, that, that was, a, that was a, a young woman. And that would have been a, a Shinto, a woman who had been a, who would be Shinto. So it was a combination of Shinto and Buddhist on the on the beach doing the blessing. What was she doing? Yeah, I, I couldn't tell you exactly what she was doing. Oh, okay. But that's 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 who she was. But it was oh, a joint effort be, uh, between a, a Shinto and, and Buddhist monks. Yes, yes. One, one of the sources I put on there in terms of social engagement was a, uh, a source. Um, I can't remember. I can't remember the, the title right now. I could go back, but I can't remember the title. Oh, wait a second. I got it in front of me. Uh, this Precious Life, Buddhist Tsunami Relief and Anti-Nuclear Activism in post 311 Japan, 311 was the date of the tsunami. And um, that's a, a really interesting volume about stories of how the Buddhist organizations banded together to bring assistance uh, to that area. Uh, at, I know that there was a big call, I mean, within a day after the tsunami, Mount Hiei, had trucks being sent up, water, blankets, you know, the things that you need in a, in a disaster like that. But that was, I, you know, I, I know for a fact that, that Hiezan was doing that, but I know for a fact all the Buddhist organizations in Japan were involved in that, in that activity. And they would consider that part of, of socially engaged Buddhism, you know, saying, and then later, of course, there came the the more religious aspect of, of going and performing um, funerals and memorial services in 
you know, um, uh, what, do, what do you call the suits you wear around a nuclear waste site, you know, hazard, you know, nuclear hazard suits or biohazard suits, um, you know, but before the biohazard suits and the, and the funerals came the, the initial aid of blankets and food and water and, and housing and those things. And I remember that, that year we were supposed to do something. I can't remember what it was, but um, we were informed that there was no money for whatever it was that we were going to do because all the money had gone to those, to those activities. Yeah. Jose, you had your hand up before, I think. Uh, yes, yes. Uh, share some thoughts um, from what you were talking about as far as appropriation. Yeah. Um, those thoughts are that as a young person, 17 and 18, uh, I started to become very engaged in social justice and anti-war. That was also about the time that I started Buddhist studies. And there was a disconnection between my social engagement, my activism and my Buddhist studies, my Buddhist practice. And it took me years to understand what that disconnection was. And I think the simplest, quickest way I can explain it is we all understand the definition of dukkha. And Buddha has given eight reasons or eight causes of dukkha. And two of them are wanting things that you don't have and having things that you don't want. So substitute, I have war, I don't want it. I have racial injustice, I don't want it. Um, I want justice, I want peace. And I approached that through my engagement with three defilements. I was angry, I was greedy, and I also was dualistic. I was, there was delusion. And that's where it gets back over to what you were saying about appropriation. Because when we go through delusion, what we do is we have that self and other. And one of the first things we do is we discriminate like having self and other, and then we move on to start to appropriate it. And then <laughs> comes the real problem of attachment. And so I found in my early years that I was going through all these three defilements as I was practicing, engaging in social action. And it wasn't for years and years and years that I understood what the Bodhisattva vow was really all about, that we have to engage without anger, without greed, and without this dualistic attachment. And so when you were mentioning the appropriation, it was just, again, I, your use of the word colonialism was just spot on. So I wanted to share that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, Jake. Yes, I just wanted to kind of mention something about the term engaged Buddhism, because to me, I think maybe because you'd mentioned earlier in the presentation about uh, the differences between engaged Buddhism and what engagement in other religions look like. And I think maybe one of the reasons why the term engaged Buddhism was coined was is maybe because of the Buddhist monastic lifestyle, uh, particularly in the Shravaka path, where you know, you can kind of, you can see in other religions, the difference between the spiritual and the worldly, but it's not, it's not as prominently featured in my opinion, compared to like particularly Theravada Buddhism, especially. Uh, and there is a, an engaged uh, Buddhist monk that I've spoken to on numerous occasions. And one of the things that he told me, and he tells this to pretty much any, any student that he comes across, anybody who, uh, who's learning with him, he, he always tells them, you know, why do you feel the need to practice like you're a monk when you're a lay person? And he has to tell that to everybody because everybody's constantly trying to live a monastic lifestyle he finds. And so going back to the idea of the engaged Buddhist label, I feel like that might be part of the reason because people kind of feel like it's, it, they kind of feel like they need to remove themselves from the world in order to practice, or at least that, that's how it can seem in the West to people who aren't necessarily familiar. 
Well, I, I, I think there is that, and we see it not only in some, but not all of the Theravada schools. Remember, you, you saw the picture of the Thai monks who were wrapping the robe around the trees. Um, and there's a really strong movement, not only in Sri Lanka, but also in Burma of, again, in Burma, it's some of the Buddhists, not all the Buddhists, because some of the Buddhists are, are nationalists and, and uh, um, mug and thugs, but some of the Buddhists are actually involved in, in social welfare organizations and that. One of the things that's really curious that, that I found a number of years ago is that Thich Nhat Hanh actually got his ideas from uh, Taiwan because he had been visited by some Taiwanese monks and nuns um, in the 1950s. And after the war, Taiwanese Buddhism had been, well, during the war, Taiwanese Buddhism was, inv was influenced by Tendai, Japanese Tendai, when Taiwan was under the um, uh, occupation forces of Japan. And from that came, was a reintroduction of Tian Tai Buddhism to Taiwan. And from that and Pure Land Buddhism came a, they didn't call it an engaged Buddhism, but their Buddhism was primarily dealing with social welfare systems. So much so that some of the Taiwanese Buddhist organizations call those organizations not really Buddhists because they don't seem to have a practice. All they do is social welfare practices. Their social welfare, welfare practices are so large that the net amount spent on things that would be equivalent to our Medicare and, and Social Security, the, the Buddhist expenditure of funds exceeds the Taiwanese expenditure of funds for those same things. That's, that's how widespread it is. But there you really see, you really see that, that, that um, some of the, of the Buddhists in Taiwan ob really object to what we would refer to as, as engaged Buddhism, whereas that is a very dominant form. And that's where Thich Nhat Hanh got the idea and I mean, that's according to his writings, you know, that I'm not making a claim that he didn't, that he didn't make. Are there any other? And, and you know, we can, we can open up the conversation a bit because I, I think that, you know, today there was, um, in the United States, there was a very, it was a very historic <laughs> and And uh, we recognize that in the next week, we're going to be really under the gun. Um, so we can do sharing for a while also. Jose? Well, I just wanted to um, do a play on words, if you don't mind. If we take engaged as a adjective and Buddhism as a noun, perhaps what we should do is turn them both into verbs. And that would be the Bodhisattva vow. Right. Nice, nice word play. <laughs> Are there any other comments, thoughts? Okay, we can, we can move along then. Um, so I'm going to mute everyone once again. Most of us have been asked at one time or another, if you could live in any one period of time, oops, sorry about that. <laughs> If you could live in any one period of time, when would that be? And there are a number of times that I can imagine would be exciting or interesting, such as Nalanda in the third century CE. An era that I've often thought about is the beginning through the middle of the Meiji Restoration in Japan. <clears throat> and the reason I've often thought about it is because Japan in a short period of time, about 30 years, went from being a feudal society to an industrial society on a par with Europe. In the 1890s, Japan fought a war with Russia and won, and that in and of itself would have been considered impossible just 30 years earlier. And reading the histories of that time are fascinating. When I think about the cultural and social changes that, are hap that were happening in Japan, it's very exciting. 
But to best understand that, I must also consider that this was a period of great turmoil and suffering as a society awoke from an emergent state of its modernity into a new world of industrialization, invention, science, foreign wars, social displacement, and rapid urbanization. How would I have responded to the tearing apart of the society that had been in place for the previous 270 or so years? And in some ways, that's how I'm looking at the time we're, look, we're living in right now, not just in America, but in the world. Some of the changes that are so necessary and so long in coming, the reorganization of our society based upon white privilege and white supremacy, will we be able to shed the dead, dark red stain of 400 plus years of black people's torment? Can we really live up to the projected ideal of equality for all, regardless of race, ethnicity, gender, and economic deprivation? Can we reverse the militarization of our police force, whose motto is to protect and defend, not just white folks, but everyone? There is so much more in the mix that I can barely imagine even all the variables. In 200 years, will I think, I would like to go back to the beginning of the 21st century in America, or will I look, look at going back to it like going back to 1350 at the height of the bubonic plague in Europe. What we as a society, what we as individuals do now will determine how people in 200 years will think of us that are living now. What we do now will determine how people in 200 years will be living at that time. When I spoke about this evening as engaged Buddhism, being what we need to be practicing right now, not only for our self-serving ends, but for the benefit of our descendants and those who live in the not so distant future, we really must think about expanding our practices in order to fulfill our vows to save all sentient beings. This is the purpose in our life that will bring the greatest rewards to each one of us personally and to our society collectively. This is not just the parable of the conjured city in chapter seven of the Lotus Sutra, in which we keep walking toward the marvelous rest and sukkur that lies in front of us as a mirage. As it says in chapter 13, encouragement to, fir to hold firm, please do not worry after the Buddha's passing in the midst of a fearful evil age. We will teach this sutra far and wide. There will be many unwise people who insult and mock us and subject us to stick and sword. We will endure it all. We must do this with inner peace and a sustained effort at achieving outer peace. Outer peace is not the avoidance of conflict. It is peace with the earth. It is peace between people of different colors, genders, sexual orientation, countries of origin. Peace between those who hold ideas different than our own. This is what it means to achieve awakening within one's lifetime. Svaha. You can resolve to live your life with integrity. Let your credo be this. Let the lie come into the world. Let it even try, triumph, but not through me. Alexander Solzhenitsyn. Thank you everyone for being here this evening and participating. The next week may very well be a trying one. We must be strong, purposeful, and compassionate. As a Sangha, we will not only ride out the storm, but we have an opportunity to bring about real change if we have faith in our teachings and each other. And for those who can't read the cartoon, it says, there's a building a peace palace in rural Nebraska might not be the best idea. A fellow meditating on the left. I'm not so sure how I feel about inner peace. I want to show support for my inner president, the fellow in the middle. I'm worried I might endanger my inner troops and the fellow on the right, my inner Cindy 
Cindy Sheehan is a pawn of my inner left. Go in peace and imagine change.